for the years. And uh, I mean, I, I remember Ron in the early days and he, he ran it for years, didn't he? Which was absolutely great. And uh, it's always a joy to, to join you uh, physically normally. This is a bit of a new experience, isn't it? For many of us. Um, and it was lovely to see Father Brian. I haven't seen you for a bit. So special greetings to you, my friend, from the 1970s. Gosh, frightening thought. Um, and I very much appreciated the mass with the bishop and his homily. We lost the sound occasionally. Uh, I don't quite know why, but we heard most of his homily and he was very positive about the Holy Spirit in a very good and exciting way. And I was listening to the sharings that have brought us to this point. Um, and to be honest, I mean, one could just quietly go away and think about what people shared. You don't really need um, a talk in a sense. However, I, I have agreed to do this and I'm very happy to, of course. Um, during the lockdown, it's been very interesting because normally I travel quite a lot. Um, and I travel abroad still, less than I used to, but still quite a bit. And um, I go to quite a few meetings. And of course, all of that stopped. Meetings are on Zoom. <coughs> Travel abroad has pretty much stopped for the moment. I am due to go to Poland, I think, in late November, if that works. But otherwise, I've declined to go when one or two people have asked me. So I've been at home and that's been really nice. I've been with Sue, but I mean, after a few days, you start kind of looking around wondering quite what you should be doing. So um, things are very tidy. I mean, my office is immaculate. Uh, I took 26 bags of rubbish to the tip, um, all sorts of old things, letters and papers and stuff that I just never got round to clearing out and throwing away. But then I decided I, I probably should um, do a bit of writing. And much to my amazement, uh, during the lockdown, I've just finished my third book. Two of them have been published by um, Good News Books, New Life Publishing. And so I've written three books. The first one happened because I began thinking a bit about the past. Um, and I, I realized when I thought through my life that I'd never actually written it down, really, what sort of the Lord did. And so I've done that. And that's the first book. It's called um, Surprised by the Spirit. Uh, and it was very interesting in the, in the beginning of it because it goes back to the early war years when my father was serving overseas um, and uh, spent a lot of time with my mother, with her parents. And I used to get taken down to this convent of enclosed Benedictine sisters when I was sort of two years old. And I used to be passed through the grill uh, to the Reverend Mother, and she used to pass me on to the sisters. And I realized when I thought about this, I really never had a chance uh, to avoid becoming very committed to the Lord. Because I used to be passed around 40 sisters who used to hug me and kiss me and pray over me. And this used to happen three times a week. So it was amazing. And this triggered the thinking about, you know, what's life been about. So that was my beginning really. So I had no chance, did I? I mean, <laughs> the prayers of 40 enclosed nuns, three times a week, hugs and kisses and, and praying over me was, was amazing really. So the Holy Spirit, I think, has been, working in my life well i know you know for years and years even before i got baptized in the spirit in 1976 and so the text you've given me this morning is a very very interesting but simple text it's from the first chapter of luke's gospel verse 41 and it's about elizabeth and the text you've given me is elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 41. And that first chapter of Luke is really very interesting. And I'm going to try and do two things this morning. Uh, one of them is I'm going to speak a little bit about the Holy Spirit for people who are watching this morning who may not be very familiar 
with baptism in the spirit and, and all of this. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. And then I'm going to try and talk a little bit about where the spirit seems to be leading us. Um, because I know from the people who shared and others that many of you have been at this almost as long as I have, some possibly even longer, and you're very developed in the Holy Spirit, and that's great. But this little text, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So in the first chapter of Luke, um, the first thing that happens is, of course, that the angel comes to Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth. They have been trying to have children. They've never had children. They're quite let's say, mature in years. And um, the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and says, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to give him the name John. That's verse 13. And then a couple of verses further on, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this, of course, is all about the birth of John the Baptist. So Elizabeth... Uh, becomes pregnant through the Holy Spirit coming upon her and and her son John when he's born he's filled with the Holy Spirit um, and then a little bit further on uh, of course Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her what's going to happen to her that she's going to have Jesus and again uh, she says at the end of the, of the message of the angel in verse 35 she says how can this be because uh, i mean i'm a single woman and the angel replies the holy spirit will come upon you verse 35 and the power of the most high will overshadow you so we've already got by the time we get to verse 35 two specific comings of the spirit to the baby john the baptist not and and not coming uh, coming it to mary to make jesus possible so it's it's um it's it's very positive and very exciting and so mary if you remember goes to visit her cousin elizabeth goes to see her and elizabeth when mary goes she's she's five months pregnant at that time and um it's when mary greets elizabeth in in verse um 40 when elizabeth heard mary's greeting verse 41 the baby john leapt in her womb and elizabeth was filled with the holy spirit and that's our text for today and the response to that because elizabeth says to mary this is what happened to me and mary's response is the magnificat my soul glorifies the lord so we've got the spirit at work very, very specifically and very clearly on these two visits of the angel Gabriel, resulting from which we have the spirit in action. And Mary stays three months with Elizabeth and then she, she leaves Elizabeth and of course John the Baptist is born. And if you go on a little bit in the Gospel of Luke, we, when we come to chapter 3, we have the very clear coming of the Spirit upon Jesus. Jesus is baptized. The Spirit comes down upon him in the form of a dove. And we hear the voice of the Father saying that this is his beloved Son and his favor is on him. So this is very significant. In the beginning of Luke's Gospel, we have the Holy Spirit doing these things. And of course, once Jesus has been baptized by John and, and has received the Holy Spirit coming in the form of a dove, Jesus is immediately taken into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It says, first verse of chapter four in Luke's gospel, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And you remember the stories of the temptations. So Jesus, as soon as he's full of the Spirit, the Spirit takes him into the desert to be tempted. 
And after the 40 days, in verse 14 of chapter 4, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And of course, he went to Nazareth. And, and that's where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he goes to the synagogue, which is what he always did when he was there. And he was given the Bible, as we would say, um, and he stood up to read. And what he chooses to read is from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is on me. And he starts his public ministry. And I'm sure it's very significant to us that ministry starts in the power of the Spirit. So it's Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, that he quotes. And he goes on to say, to preach the good news, etc. So, so we've got um, your, your short text from the first part of Luke's Gospel. Really says what we're then going to hear developed by Luke, the key role of the Holy Spirit. Anything that's going to be in the Lord's love and the Lord's power and the Lord's anointing needs the Holy Spirit. And this is why Luke tells us John, Elizabeth, Mary, all under the power and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's the same for you and for me today. We live our Christian lives in the power and the love and the, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. But when you talk to people generally in the church, I'm thinking particularly in the Catholic Church, but generally in the church, the Holy Spirit is often the most neglected member of the Trinity. Why? If you say to people, what are the most important feasts in the year of the church? They'll talk about Christmas. They'll talk about Easter. Very rarely do they mention Pentecost and the coming of the Spirit. So the Spirit isn't in people's minds. Why? Well, when you think about it, I think the first thing is a lot of people hardly think of the Holy Spirit as a person. They think of God the Father. We know what a father is. We may have had a good one or a human one that was a bit weak, you know, but we know God the Father. We think of Jesus, the Son, and we see the image of Jesus on the cross whenever we go into a church. So we think of the Father and, the G and, the, and Jesus as people, but the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's described as all kinds of things, wind, fire, cloud, water, oil, breath, a dove. When Jesus receives the Spirit, he comes down in the form of a dove at his baptism. So we don't instantly think of the Spirit as a person, but he is a person, absolutely as much as the Father and the Son, and you know that. And I had a very good example of this some years ago i went to rockhampton cathedral in australia at the invitation of the bishop to run a weekend uh, on the, the holy spirit and um he was showing me before the weekend began he was showing me around his cathedral rockhampton cathedral very nice cathedral he told me it was very old uh, it was built in 1928 um, but that's old for Australians, I think, isn't it? So um, I was looking around the cathedral, and when we got up onto the, high, onto the main altar, he showed me behind the altar was a very nice wall which had stained glass windows. And the stained glass windows were uh, Jesus with the disciples and, and very nicely portrayed. And above there was a, a Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. And he said to me, I've just had all these windows replaced about six months ago because we had a landslip and this wall collapsed and I lost all the stained glass windows. And um, I had experts come, but they really didn't think they could put it together because there was too much damage. So the wall was rebuilt and I looked up in my records to see where did the stained glass windows come from? And they came from Birmingham in England 
when the cathedral was built in 1928. So I contacted the company, they still existed, and uh, I told them what had happened. They looked at their records and they saw what they delivered and they said, we'll, we'll do the windows again for you and we'll send them out and we'll send somebody with them to put them up. So a few months later, the windows duly arrived with the fitter and um, he, he started to put up the windows and he, and he did them, you know, the disciples and Jesus and everything, they were great. And then he knocked on my door, the bishop said one morning and he said, um, now then bishop, um, it's about the bird. And I said to him, I'm sorry, the bird, the dove. Oh, the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, that, the Holy Spirit. He said, now I just want to know how you want him because he's up at the top. Um, do you want him coming? Do you want him going? Or do you want him flying past? Because it was a circular Holy Spirit. He said, you can have whichever you like. And, and the bishop said, well, I, I, I think I'd like him coming. And he said, well, you can have him coming. I can do that for you. He said, but I need to tell you, he looks great flying past. And the bishop said, as he said the words, I thought to myself, that's quite a revelation. Because for a lot of people, the Holy Spirit in their lives is flying past. He's there. We say in the, in the creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. But he's not coming, he's not with me, and he's not coming, he's just going past, and we can kind of wave to him. And I think a lot of the people in the church tend to do that, and, and that's what we have to overcome, because yes, he's a divine person, and Jesus himself said to the disciples in John 16, it's better for you that I go, because unless I go, the spirit can't come. And the disciples must have thought, what could be better than having Jesus? Really? But it is better because Jesus physically could only be in one place. The Spirit is everywhere. The Spirit can be with each of us, whatever we're doing. And we know that on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus had been resurrected, had ascended into heaven, and he poured out the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is Acts chapter 2, um, and, and the Spirit fell on the disciples and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was with them in the upper room, and we know the result. There was light, there was fire, there was wind, there was sound, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they were transformed. They began to speak in tongues, they began to worship, praise God, they came out from the upper room and they could speak the languages of all the people who were outside from all over the known world who'd come for the feast at the time. So, so the Holy Spirit transforms us. Now, let me just say, which of course most of you are very aware of all this that I'm saying, but I think it's important just to emphasize it again. Of course, we receive the Holy Spirit when we are baptized. But many of us were baptized as babies or toddlers or young people. We received the Spirit. The Spirit dwells in us from that time. We receive the Holy Spirit again when we're confirmed in a very specific sacramental way to equip us to grow up in our faith. So we have the Spirit, that's not the question. If you're a baptized Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. But the question is not have I got the Spirit, but has the Spirit got me? And the challenge is to respond to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when we talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, opening ourselves to the Spirit at some point, what we're doing is we are saying yes to the Holy Spirit. We're saying to the Holy Spirit, yes, be free in my life. Equip me, anoint me, use me. And, and that's what we have to do. And the question for many of us is that we know a lot of people who have never done that. They've never given the Spirit freedom to move in them and through them. 
so they live a rather struggling kind of life and and they don't know much about the gifts of the spirit they've never experienced those but that's really really important that we respond and so that would be my call to all of us those who've never done it think about it pray about it look at the scriptures go on your knees and say to the holy spirit be free in my life i welcome you i love you work in my life move in my life guide me lead me to those who've done that years ago maybe one year maybe 20 years maybe 40 years ago we still need to say come holy spirit Amen. we need to be refreshed we need to commit ourselves again we need to be renewed in the power and the love and the presence of the spirit that's really important and we must do that and if we don't do that gradually we'll let the spirit kind of go to the side again so we need to come regularly and say come holy spirit yes i've done this before yes i know you've been working in my life and are working there today but i want to be more open to you that's the important thing and just to hold on to the question if you have not done this before and are thinking about it the question is not have i got the spirit if you're a baptized christian you've got the spirit the question is has the spirit got me have you consciously deliberately invited the spirit to take control of your life to guide you equip you use you to do whatever god asks or are you still just doing what you think the choice is yours we all have free will so that's why god hasn't put the spirit straight in and overtaken our free will we have to ha we we our free will is sacred to god and we need freely to say come holy spirit i never thought much about that when i was growing up <laughs> i mean it didn't you know i told you a little story about all these nuns praying over me but it hadn't affected me much i was educated by the jesuits and they did a good job that was great they taught me my faith intellectually and I, I was quite good at it i've got a few re prizes on the bookshelves in my office and and i i enjoyed it in a sense but it wasn't a living faith because when i left school at the age of 18 i had never said come holy spirit in the sense of wanting to release the spirit in my life so for me, my faith was an intellectual thoughts, discussions, debates. University was great. I was forever being asked to explain Christianity and getting three pints of beer in the pub for doing so. Um, but I wasn't living my faith. That didn't come till some years later in 1976, when an Anglican minister, Barry Kissel, some of you may know, uh, I, I, we'd been to a service that he'd led and it was great and when I was leaving he, he said to me after thinking about it for a few minutes when I was saying goodbye to him you don't know how much the Lord loves you do you and he prayed for me in the pew and I thought about it I felt kind of warm and friendly but that was it but when I went to work in the city of London the next day and I went out for a walk in the morning because I was a bit I was thinking about all this um, I went to St. Mary Moorfield in the city near Liverpool Street. And I went down to the front and I knelt down in front of the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle and I said, Lord, what is going on? Do you love me? And I was overwhelmed with the love of God. I was on my face on the floor, repenting of sins. I was standing up and singing hymns and having a wonderful time. And I was flooded with the Holy Spirit. I spoke in tongues, although I didn't really know what that was. I just thought I must have caught it from that vicar because he'd done it. I thought he was a foreigner. Um, and I, I was just blessed completely. But it was my personal surrender. 
And as I was going back to my office, I'd been for about an hour in the church and I had to get back to work. I was going up Moorgate and everybody coming towards me was stepping off the pavement and giving me one of those funny looks. And I thought, what's the matter with them all? And I realized I was singing at the top of my voice. I was singing, praise my soul, the King of heaven. And you don't see that much at lunchtime in the city. So they all thought I was a nutcase. We were getting out of the way. But I, I, I went home and I told Sue what happened. I phoned Barry Kissel and he said, oh, I've been waiting for you to call, get in the car and come. So I went and he said, way, the Lord's got things for you to do, my friend. When you stood in front of me yesterday, I knew it. And the Lord gave me the word for you. You don't really know how much I love you. So what's happened to you today? So I told him. So that was 1976. That was the beginning of an amazing journey. Very challenging, very exciting. All kinds of things have happened since then. And, you know, that's just what it's all about. Everything changes because the Holy Spirit is now in the driving seat of my life. Now, sometimes I don't let him drive. I, I do a bit of backseat driving, um, but I shouldn't. He's in the driving seat and he should be the one who leads me in all that I am and all that I do. I can tell you just before we came on this, we had a bit of trouble getting through and the right screen and the picture and it looked like we weren't linking with you on the Zoom. And, and um, I ignored the Holy Spirit, who was no doubt reassuring me it was all fine, and started telling Sue what I thought of her pathetic efforts to get us through. Um, and, and I wasn't very spiritual at all. No. And then when she did get through, um, and we were all right, and I could see Alistair on the so screen and everything, um, she prayed over me that I'd, I'd actually get my priorities right again. I'd lost it. And I had a bit, very humanly. But she prayed over me and then everything was fine. So you see, the divine grace that we receive in the sacraments of baptism and confirmation has to be fully released when we say a real personal yes to the Holy Spirit and ask him to work in us and through us. That's what we have to do. Only then, alive in the spirit, are we fully equipped Christians able to live dynamic, effective Christian lives and to have a noticeable influence on those around us. And that's what it's all about. And this is where the gifts of the spirit come, the charisms, the charismatic gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We, we know well what they're all about, don't we? Wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, faith, healing, miracles, uh, discernment of spirit, gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, these amazing gifts of the spirit. And one of the fascinating things um, I've been thinking about recently is this move of the Holy Spirit that we're living in, which is so powerful, and this is now for those who've been around this a bit, we really have to say that the beginning of this was the Azusa Street Centennial in Los Angeles in April 1906. The spirit was poured out on this simple little church when they got their new pastor, William J. Seymour. The church they were in wasn't big enough. They moved into 312 Azusa Street because of this amazing outpouring of the Spirit. William J. Seymour was the son of slaves. He was black, the son of slaves. And when he came to this church, the Spirit was poured out in incredible strength and power. That was in 1906. You just said 2006. 1906. My wife is telling me I said 2006. I should have said 1906. It's over 100 years ago. So that was, people came to that church from everywhere to experience this amazing power of the Holy Spirit. The gifts were manifest. There were prophecies, healings, miracles, everything. And, and it, they, they were overwhelmed with people. Thousands came. 
and, and they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some of them were baptized in the Spirit before they even got to the church because they're on their way. And of course, they went away from there determined to make this happen where they lived and in their church. But many churches, and these were mainly Protestants, to be fair, there were Catholics, but mainly Protestants, but their churches didn't accept it. This was too much. And they, they were forced, really, to leave and set up new fellowships, new churches, new communities, alive in the spirit. And this is seen as the beginning of Pentecostalism and the charismatic renewal of the Christian world. 1906, Azusa Street, Los Angeles. Now, 61 years later, 1967, the Spirit is poured out on the Catholic Church. And we know about the Duquesne University students and their weekend and how they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And of course, they went to their senior priest in the university, the head of theology, and he looked up the church records to see if this was all okay. And of course, what he found was Vatican II, which was four years earlier, three to four years earlier, had a section in the document on the church, Lumen Gentium, section 12, on the charismatic gifts, where the charismatic gifts were itemized from 1 Corinthians 12, and thoroughly endorsed as from the Holy Spirit, needed for the church to live a full and effective, committed life, needed for evangelization, and key to the way forward. So the gifts had already been endorsed by the church. And this had quite a lot to do with Cardinal Sunans, who had been very involved in Vatican II. And of course, he was the one that Pope Paul sent to America to have a look at this phenomenon that was now happening. And of course, he, he, he decided it was absolutely the Holy Spirit. And he himself was filled with the Spirit. So that was absolutely crucial and important. The church had prepared the way. So when it happened in 1967, they could look back at the documents and say, well, this that we are experiencing is that which the church advocates the council fathers promote. And this is it happening. So the charismatic renewal was always had always an openness by the thinking and good leaders of the Catholic world. Now, some people didn't like it, obviously, but that was really what happened. And, and of course, that has progressed through the different popes. Pope John Paul II was a big supporter of the renewal. Pope um, Benedict describes himself as a friend of the charismatic renewal. And we know Pope Francis is baptized in the Holy Spirit and has promoted the renewal everywhere and has set up Charis as an official church organization to support, promote, and help the renewal when it's needed. So this Holy Spirit power is there. And the first um, of the objectives of Charis is that everyone should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this brings me, in a sense, to, to my kind of moving towards a close, Alistair, point, uh, which is that um, what are we called to do in this current time? Well, I think the simple answer to that is we need to actively work to promote the baptism in the spirit throughout the church. To people from the outside also, people coming in, absolutely, need to be evangelized, baptized in the spirit and take their place in the life of the church. But somehow we also need to find ways to promote the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are the second item in the objectives of Charis. First the baptism, then the gifts in the life of the church. We need to find ways to do that. Because however we look at it, we are not just 
like um, the charismatic renewal isn't just a sort of movement. It never was a movement. It doesn't have a human founder or a set of rules and regulations. It's a genuine outpouring of the spirit, but it's been classified quite often as a movement. Uh, but it's not just that, that we're promoting our thing. With Charis, it is now the church's thing. The church's thing. It's a recognized body under the Pontifical Council for the Laity, Family and Life. And, and when people are now speaking about it in the church, uh, card, the cardinal of uh, there is, I mean, promoting it. So, so what we're doing when we promote the baptism in the Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit is we're promoting something which is officially endorsed by the church in a formal way. So we don't have to be slightly embarrassed and, and we don't have to accept it when people say, oh, that's just your thing. It's not just my thing. It is my thing. But my thing is also the church's thing today. It's, it's amazing. And of course, the Lord is working through the church and through the individual members to promote and develop this. I mean, he's brought this into being through Francis being elected as our Pope. And we know the story of Francis. He wasn't very pro-charismatic at one time. A mm -hmm. Samba dancing party was what he called it. But he looked into it seriously. And he realized it was wonderful. It was vital. It was of the spirit. It was of the Lord. It needed help. And so as a, as a Cardinal, an Archbishop, Bishop, Archbishop rather, and then Cardinal. He developed it. He encouraged it in, in, in Argentina. And then when he was elected Pope, he's done exactly the same thing. But he's got more clout these days. And Charis is his vision. He instituted it. We just have to make sure that Charis doesn't get unhealthily institutionalized. Amen. We need the spirit moving freely in and through Charis. And for that to happen, you and I, who have experienced this new life in the spirit, who know what it's all about, who are living it, who are praying for people, who are seeing results from that, we need to just redouble our efforts to promote that throughout the church. And we're doing it now under the auspices of Charis, a church organization um it's a judicial reality in the church i mean there's all kinds of phrases you can use to describe it but it simply means it's okay in the view of the church and it's part of the church and that's what we need to do so the charismatic gifts we must not lose sight of those um, it's easy to do that um, unless we're open to being used and the Lord uses us in all kinds of different ways, doesn't he? I mean, we have in our family amazing examples of the use of the gifts of the Spirit by people outside ministering to us. We have a 50-year-old, 48, how old is Luke? 40. 40, is he 40? He's, oh, he's 40, sorry, I'm checking on my children's age with the expert. Um, we have Luke, who is 40, and, and, and he was clinically described as deaf when he was three, four years old. And, and he was prayed over by a Pentecostal pastor who used the word of knowledge and he was healed. Totally healed. And when he went back to be checked, he had A1 hearing. Now, you can't get better than that, can you? No, I selective You know? Um, so he does have, like all children, he has selective hearing. But that's something else. I have selective hearing sometimes. Absolutely. And my wife is saying absolutely true. But we, use, we have the gifts. And, and I've been on the receiving end of prophetic gifts. I, I went to the Singapore consultation in, in, in um, Penang, many, no, not in Penang, somewhere in, in Singapore. Singapore, Singapore, many, many years ago, 1988, nine. And um, uh, I was active in the renewal. I was chairman of the English NSC. I wasn't involved particularly internationally, but I, it was an ecumenical event and I was involved a bit ecumenically and I went to this consultation 
And there were about 150 leaders from all over the world of different denominations. And on the last day of the event, um, I, I was in the lift going up to my bedroom, which was on the fourth floor, I think, of the hotel where we were staying. And um, uh, a well-known person got into the lift. And as we were going up, he turned to me and said, the Lord's told me you're going to be the next president of Icarus. And I was like, uh, the lift stopped and he got out because it was his floor and disappeared. And I thought about this and I thought, really? And so the next day I went to find him. He'd left early. Well, if I tell you that 18 months later, I was the president of Icarus. And because of the prophetic word, I found it a little bit easier to understand and accept than I would have done otherwise because it was confirmed as a as what was going to happen by an Italian lady I'd never met in my life before she came to me a few days after this first prophetic word and said the same thing anyway just by the way but what I want to say to you to close is we need to be promoting this we need to be encouraging it. And I know I don't always do it. I mean, there are times when I just don't have the, quite the energy to kind of go into this, but other times I do. And so the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits and tongues and, dis and from interpreting tongues, these are things that must be part of our lives, not just for ourselves, because the gifts are given to build the church and for the blessing of others. And we mustn't overlook them. We, we must promote them, we must use them, we must develop them, we must be open to receive them, but equally to give them. And sometimes that can be quite tricky. You know, people don't look particularly receptive, but if the Lord says do it, we need to do it. In love. In love. I mean, the interesting thing about the gifts, uh, we have Paul's letter to the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, gifts. Chapter 13, all about love. Chapter 14, about how to use the gifts. And, and Paul puts the chapter on love because love is the heart of Christianity. And we use our gifts, well, they're not ours, they're the Spirit's gifts through us. We use them in love to serve others. Yes. But it must be in love. It's, it can't be just to make a point or to, to get some kind of kudos. It's nothing to do with us. We're channels. But love is key. Gifts, love, results. And the results are to help evangelization and the building of the church amen. amen so that's my message to you if you haven't experienced the baptism in the holy spirit find somebody who will pray for you just be open and let the holy spirit fill you like he did with elizabeth um mary's cousin in in our scripture for today luke 1 41 like he did with John the Baptist, like he does with Jesus when the dove comes upon him and then he's led by the Spirit into his public ministry and right through it all the time. And, and you know, this is so crucial and this is for you and me. So if you haven't experienced this, open yourself and find somebody just to pray with you. If you can't find anybody, you can do it yourself. Just say, Lord, I am open to this. Fill me. Give me whatever you want. Use me in love to serve you. And for those of us who've been at it for years, just think about it again. Ask for a new touch of the Spirit, a new outpouring, a refilling, a special anointing. And be open all the time to the possibility of the Lord using you in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the charismatic gifts. Again, in love for the blessing of others and for the glory of God. Amen. And that's my message to you this morning. So let me just pray for you and I'll hand you back to Alistair who will lead us into a time of prayer and ministry. 
Lord, I really just want to thank you this morning for the simple, basic, but absolutely crucial message that we all need to be open to the filling of the Holy Spirit. We need to release the Holy Spirit in our lives, in your love, in your power, for the blessing of other people. So Lord, help us to be open. Help us to use the gifts that you give us through your spirit to bless others. Lord, may we never lay those aside. May we never feel, well, we've done that now, Lord. We're just going to take it easy. Lord, use us, I pray, in the power of your spirit, in the love of your spirit, to transform the lives of those around us for your glory. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank, Thank you, you Lord. Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Pour out your spirit, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your Spirit on us today. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, Pour out your spirit, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit on us today. So if you'd like to join me in this prayer, please do so. I renew my baptismal anointing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I profess you, Jesus, as my Saviour and Lord, crucified and risen from the dead. I accept your salvation and strength to sever all bondage with the past, to free me from slavery to sin, to overcome the opposition of the devil, to enable me to live as a child of God, perfectly loved by the Father. I open my heart for you to work more fully in me and through me. I desire to fulfill your call on my life. I offer you my whole self to allow your Holy Spirit to renew within me all the gifts and graces given at baptism and confirmation, wisdom and understanding, counsel and fortitude, knowledge, piety and fear of the Lord. And I ask you to fan into a flame the manifestation charisms of service, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healings, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues and interpretation of tongues. I desire all your gifts and graces wrapped in the greatest gift of all, love. Come Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus. Just in a few minutes of silence, just offer yourself as Charles was recommending us to do. Just open yourself and say, yes, come Holy Spirit.
And I pray now in the name and the authority and the power of Jesus for everyone participating, that they will be open to receive his blessing right now. Lord Jesus, send the power of your spirit into the hearts of your people. Bless them where they need to be blessed. Strengthen what is weak. Heal what is sick. Give new strength, hope and life to your people so that we can give you glory, Lord, and take the good news of your love to a world that desperately needs you. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.